All right, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Let's all stand together. You all made it here on time. Good for you. It's great to have you guys here. Uh, before we get started, um, I just want to remind us of something real quick. In Isaiah chapter 40, God says that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. He will cause them to soar like eagles. Don't you love that? He'll cause them to run without getting weary. And so this morning, I'm going to share with you a new chorus that we'll sing. Just thinking about that truth that God is with us, that he's a God of strength and a God of rest. Isn't that good this morning, that he's a God of rest? So let's wait upon the Lord this morning. So come on, let's wait. Just wait upon the Lord. He will renew our strength. So come on. So come on, let's wait upon the Lord. He will renew. He will renew. Just wait upon the Lord. If we just wait, He will renew our strength. So come on, so come on, let's wait upon the Lord. He will renew our strength.
It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. It's no longer. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? You guys can take a seat. Um, my name is Austin. I've uh, been at Calvary for about three years, and it's so wonderful to be here today. If you're new here today, uh, we have a welcome center right through those doors in the back. Um, so after service, um, grab somebody over there and introduce yourselves. And We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to get to figure out um, you know, who you are and, and why you're here today and, and just share our love with you. So... Um, yeah, and so also life groups start this week, okay? So um, if you are already in a life group, this week is just going to be kind of a, a get to know, um, either connecting or reconnecting with your group. Um, if you're not in a life group, we do still have time. So you can uh, text find a life group at 41411, okay? So that's just get on the mobile device and text find a life group 411. 411. So we're going to turn our attention now to the video screen and watch some announcements. All right, church, not today, not tomorrow, but Tuesday is our night of worship. This is going to be a time where we're going to have an extended time of singing praise and worship to the Lord. We're also going to get into the Word of God a little bit, spend some time praying together as a church family. Students and adults will all be together. This is just such a special time, uh, a few times a year when we get to do this. So I hope that you can be there for our night of worship. As you know, we live in a 24-hour news cycle, and most of the news that we get on a daily basis, if we're being honest, is not good news. But as Christians, we've been entrusted with the gospel, which is the good news of what Jesus has done for humanity. And it's our call to share this good news with others. But how do we do this in a culture that is growing increasingly antagonistic towards Christianity? Well, we want to talk about that. And so at the end of this month, we're going to have a training forum that's going to address some practical ways for us to share our faith in today's culture. We're gonna have a time of teaching, a panel discussion with people from our church who are actively sharing their faith in the context that God's given them. And then we're just gonna discuss practical ways to engage in gospel conversation. So we hope you can make it. It's gonna be an equipping night, but I think it's gonna be an encouraging night for all of us that are there. So don't miss it. Jesus rose from the dead. 
It's such a celebratory, triumphant, powerful, glorious, transcendent message that we Christians get to preach, believe, and hold on to. And every year we have Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, a special day as a church where we declare the glorious victory of Jesus over sin and death and suffering and brokenness. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the grave. And with that attitude of celebration and victory and triumph, we want to gather together as one congregation, one group of people together on Easter Sunday at the Monterey County Fairgrounds to celebrate and rejoice in Jesus together. Part of my heart for gathering together as one on that day rather than in various services is real simple. When a sports team wins a championship, the whole city comes out to celebrate the victory of their sports team. This is a way for us to come together and celebrate Jesus. He won his victory over sin and death. That's what we get to celebrate this Easter Sunday. So, hey, bring a friend, uh, grab another church member, come on out on Easter Sunday, and let's rejoice and celebrate Jesus Christ and his victory over all of that stuff on Easter Sunday together. See you at the fairgrounds. Awesome. <laughs> so we have some great things coming on. So uh, right now we're going to get back into some worship and uh, we're going to receive the offerings. So let me just pray for it real fast. Father, we just thank you for another beautiful Sunday. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for uh, allowing us to just come into your house and, and praise and worship you, Lord. I just want to pray over this offering. Let it continue to build and expand the kingdom, Lord, and, and let us just keep sharing the good news and the love um, that you have for us with everyone else in this community. And Jesus, we just want to learn more about you today, and we want to stay within the will that you have for us, Lord, and we just love you so much. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart i know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can bid me thence depart no tongue can bid me thence depart when satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the Guilt within, upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sins Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me oh hallelujah spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king 
of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and Christ my Savior and my God, oh hallelujah, oh hallelujah, oh praise the one, the risen Son. Let's all stand together again and sing this, sing hallelujah.
Your name is greater than any name I know. Your throne is higher than any other throne. You are the author, the creator of it all. You stand alone. You stand alone. God, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. And there will never be. God, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. And there will never be. So feel that way before you, Lord, that there's nobody like you. Every time that we, in one sense, emphasize part of who you are, Lord, we, in our frailty, we so often have a hard time emphasizing the other parts of who you are. But you, Lord, are just and holy, yet merciful and loving. You are filled with righteousness, yet you are gracious and long-suffering. Lord, you are a forgiver and pardoner of sin, yet there is no offense that has escaped your sight. Lord, you are, and there is no one like you. And we so rejoice, Lord, in who you are, and we want to know you better, Lord. There's that sense within our hearts that by knowing you we are most satisfied and so lord we pray that you'd help us to know who you are that you'd help us lord to walk with you but thank you lord for who you are thank you for the glorious gospel that you've given to us and the way that we can come into your family to have you as our father in heaven lord we're thankful for who you are and and we pray that you'd open our eyes more and more to see you in your glory in Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. All right, church, you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Happy Daylight Savings Time Sunday. Let's uh, take out our Bibles this morning and turn to Mark chapter 2. We're going to be in Mark 2, verse 13 to 17. And uh, for everyone in Sanctuary 2, I'd like to welcome you as well uh, today. It says in Psalm 92, verse 1, that it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to the Most High. And that's what we're going to do this Tuesday night at Tuesday Night Church at our night of worship. We're going to praise the Lord, celebrate Him, sing to Him, and and just dedicate uh, the night to Him. So I'd love to have all of you come out on Tuesday night for our night of worship. We'll get started at 6.15 and just dedicate the whole time uh, to uh, the Lord in worship and prayer and and meditating on on his word. And then, of course, uh, life groups get started this week, so if you still need to get into a life group, uh, you can go into the Welcome Center afterwards and we'll get you plugged in with one. But let's go uh, ahead and read our whole passage this morning, and then I'll pray and lead you into the text. It's a very familiar section of Jesus' life. It says in verse 13 of chapter 2, He went out again beside the sea. And all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, verse 14, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, verse 16, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Lord, we thank you so much for this glorious message that though we have all fallen short of the glory of God, though we are all 
sinners in the sight of God. You came for us. And Lord, we love that about you. We delight in that about you. And we pray, Lord, that you would expand our minds to see how beautiful that is this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your nature and your love, yet your holiness and righteousness. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Okay, we're going to answer and, and think about one big question this morning. And here, here's the question. Who gets to enter into God's kingdom? Who gets to enter into God's kingdom? And the reason that we want to ask that question is because of the way that the book of Mark began. What's the first thing that Jesus said in the book of Mark? I keep reminding it, uh, you of it week after week. It comes from chapter 1, verse 15. When Jesus came, he said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, so Jesus came. The time is fulfilled. And with Jesus came this thing called the kingdom of God. Is It is at hand. It is there. It is reachable. We have a little clue as to who gets to go into it with his phrase, repent and believe in the gospel. So people that get to go in are people who are repenting of something, turning from something, and believing in the gospel message. But at this point in Mark's gospel, we have other clues about who gets to go into the kingdom by simply looking at the first snapshots from Jesus' life. And I'll just remind you of some of them this morning. Uh, first of all, we saw Jesus go out and select his first disciples. And so we learned there when he called them to come and follow him that the kingdom centers around Jesus. Second, he goes to a, a synagogue and immediately deals with a demon-possessed man. And there we learn that Jesus' kingdom collides with the unseen forces of evil that permeate our planet. Then we saw him go into Peter's house and heal Peter's mother-in-law and many, many people who came to the door of the house after sundown. And through that, we learned that Jesus' kingdom would confront all the natural brokenness of this world ultimately culminating in the great resurrection. And then we see Jesus go and cleanse a leper who felt that he was unclean before God. And through that, we learn that Jesus is reaching out to people who know of a spiritual uncleanness within. And then last week, we saw a, a paralyzed man lowered down to Jesus. And what did Jesus say to the man? Son, your sins are forgiven you. All of these snapshots help us understand the kind of person that Jesus wants to recruit to come into his kingdom. Right off the bat, who does he interact with? He interacts with demon-possessed, physically unhealthy, spiritually unclean sinners who were in need of forgiveness. So these are all clues as to who gets to go into the kingdom. In other words, Jesus just came to earth and he's like, who is messed up out there? I want to reach into your life. But today, Jesus will say it very bluntly, very clearly. Look at the last sentence of our paragraph today. Verse 17, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the point where you and I get to celebrate and rejoice. If you are wondering at this point, where am I or where are we in the Gospel of Mark, we've come to that spot today. We are sinners who need the Lord. Okay, and so this is where we come into the story. But there's a catch. To get into the kingdom, we have to know we're sinners. To get into the kingdom, we have to know we're sinners. As long as we self-justify, self-excuse, and self-approve, we're like the Pharisees, outside the kingdom. So we're going to see that play out in our passage today. Okay, so let's look at the first thing I want you to see. It comes from verse 13 and 14. Number one, Jesus calls people like Levi. Let me read it to you again in verse 13 and 14. It says that Jesus went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him 
him. Okay, this, this little episode, it begins with a little phrase from Mark. Did you see it there in verse 13? He says that Jesus went out again beside the sea. What, is it, what does it mean when Mark says that Jesus went out again beside the sea? Well, remember last time uh, Jesus was in the house of, of Peter? I mean, we saw it last week. He was in Peter's house. There was a great crowd that gathered. He was preaching the word to them. A paralyzed man was lowered from the roof. And he forgave the man, and then he healed him, and the people were amazed. They said, we've never seen anything like this. Okay, but there was a time that Jesus was in Peter's house before that last episode. And like I mentioned earlier, it was the day in Capernaum where he was healing Peter's mother-in-law and then many other people after sundown who came to the door of the house. And what did Jesus do that first time he was at Peter's house working great miracles? Well, the next morning, he rose up a great while before daylight, it says in verse 35 of chapter 1, and he went out into the wilderness to spend time alone with his father in prayer, getting directions for what his life and ministry were supposed to look like. So the idea seems to be the same right here. There was one episode where Jesus went into Peter's house, the next day woke up early to get alone and be by himself. Now we have another episode where Jesus is doing miracles in Peter's house, and now he goes out again, Mark says, to be alone. The assumption is that he went out to be alone with his father in prayer. And I mention this because this is a great pattern for life, you guys. The idea that we would get alone with God, receive from him, be built up by him, redirected by him, repointed by him, refocused by him, and then that we would join with others and serve them, pour out our lives for them, and then after a season, pull back Get alone with the Lord, spend time with him, and then go back out and serve others. I think every day this is a good pattern for life. So my, my exhortation is just do this, repeat this over and over until the day that you die and you will live a happy life. Pull away and go serve. Pull away and go serve. It was the model that Jesus laid down for us. Okay, but, but as Jesus did this, as he went out to the seashore to pray, the crowd, it says in verse 13, was coming to him. They wouldn't leave him alone by himself. They got around Jesus, and, and Jesus did something that by this point is typical of Jesus. He began to teach them. He wasn't working miracles, but he was teaching this crowd of people. And it, it looks like he was teaching them while he walked, because it says, as he passed by, verse 14, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. So there he is moving along the seashore. He comes by the tax booth there and he sees this man named Levi. Now the question that we should ask is, who is this character? Who is Levi? What do we know about him? One thing that we know is that he was a tax collector. I know here in Mark's gospel, it says that he was sitting at the tax booth, and that might give you the idea that he just thought this was a great place to like hang out. You know, What are we going to do today? I'm just going to go hang out at the tax booth. It's just a fun place to go be. But Luke tells us specifically that Mark was a tax, or excuse me, that Levi was a tax collector. Okay, so this was his job. This was his place of business. This was where he was employed. Now, Capernaum was a place, a city, that would have had a thriving tax industry because of all the roads that came in and out of Capernaum, attaching it to the surrounding regions. And the Roman government, they had a great road system, but they would charge people to use their roads. So when you came in or out of Capernaum, you'd have to go to the tax booth to basically pay a toll to be able to use the Roman uh, travel or Roman road system. But on top of that, uh, tax collectors in that area and region would have also taxed the local economy, would have taxed local goods. So even the fishermen that are already part of Jesus' disciple team had probably had interactions with Levi as he had taxed them on their uh, fishing uh, there in the Sea of Galilee. Now, when we think of a tax collector, we think of an IRS agent, right? And so we already have kind of negative, scary connotations. You know, if you get a letter in the mail and it's got a thing in the corner that says IRS, yeah, it's never like a happy moment in somebody's life. Like, oh, I'm so glad I heard from them, you know, kind of thing. But we really shouldn't be thinking of an IRS agent when we think of Levi, because 
in that era, the way that an, uh, a tax collector made their money was by charging the taxes that Rome required and then using threat and usury to get more money from the people that they taxed. So whatever they could get above what Rome required, they would keep for themselves. And many tax collectors grew very wealthy because they could use the power of the Roman military or police to charge exorbitant rates uh, from people. In a sense, it was sanctioned theft backed by the full force of the Roman government. And many of the tax collectors throughout Israel were Jewish. So there they are working for the Roman government, stealing from their own countrymen, their own people. And because of that, Jewish people in that region and time viewed tax collectors as traitors to Rome. And they were unforgiving in their attitude towards Jewish tax collectors. They would expel them from their synagogues. Uh, some records show us that when they went into someone's home, the home could be considered ceremonially unclean because of the presence of a tax collector. And some rabbis in that era even taught that you could lie to a tax collector and God would not hold you guilty of lying. <laughs> okay, so th this, I'm saying all this to paint the picture of how people would have felt about Levi in that era. He was a social outcast. Okay, so that's one thing we know about him. But the other thing that we know about him is that he's more commonly known by us as Matthew. Uh, he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, and when he tells the story of his conversion or his coming to follow Jesus, he speaks of himself as such, and Jesus called Matthew. Uh, and in the lists of the disciples, he's referred to often as Matthew. Uh, it's possible that he merely had two names, one Levi, one Matthew, very common in that era. It's also possible that Jesus renamed him, took away the name Levi, and gave him the name Matthew at some point. Jesus was prone to do that from time to time. We don't really know. My guess is that it was Matthew that actually changed his own name, wanting a fresh start with the Lord and, and just saying, you know, Levi was my old name. I never really lived up to that name as a man set apart for God's purposes, but I'm going to allow myself to be named now Matthew, which means gift of God. I think maybe he felt at this point that his life had become purposeful and valuable in the sight of God. But backing up from all of that, Let's just think about Jesus' call upon Levi's life. He, fall, he, he comes up to the man and he says to him, follow me, in verse 14. And there was just something that Jesus, when he saw Levi, that he saw in this man, something he wanted in this man. And the question, of course, is what would Levi do? Would he follow Jesus? Would he resist Jesus? It just says it very straightforwardly there in verse 14. It says, and he rose and followed him. Just as there was something that Jesus wanted in Levi, there was, there, there was something in Jesus that Levi wanted. He looked at Jesus and said, I'm willing to leave this to follow you. Now, now listen, let's just think about this for a second. When, when the four fishermen were called away from their place of business to follow Jesus, that was the kind of job, the kind of work that they could return to at some point. And in fact, the Gospel of John makes it clear that there was a brief window of time after Jesus rose from the dead where the fishermen did go back to the Sea of Galilee and they picked up their nets and their boats and went out and fished again for a little while. But when Matthew left the tax booth, that was a job that if he was going to stay faithful to Jesus, he could never return to. It was a dishonest profession. It, re it required usury and theft to make a living, which meant it was inconducive to Christianity. So when he left the tax booth, he is leaving it for good. Now, now we can imagine this today. There are some careers, of course, that are just incompatible with Christianity, you know, just things that you just shouldn't be doing if you're a believer, you know, things that are against the law, illegal, you know, at worst, and, and even just compromise your faith at best. But other jobs uh, are totally compatible with the Christian faith. And then it seems that we're living in an era where there are some careers that are probably the most difficult of all because they just co require a lot of tact and wisdom to be able to navigate as a believer. And if you're, if you're, in, your, you're in one of those fields, you know, my prayers are with you because I can't imagine some of the challenges that you face as you navigate your Christianity and the career that you've chosen. 
But for Levi, it was really clear. He just knew, I cannot continue as a tax collector and follow Jesus. And so when he left that tax booth, it spoke of radical sacrifice that he was making. It kind of reminds me of a story in the Old Testament where Elijah, the prophet, was looking for a replacement and God connected him to a younger man named Elisha who would become a prophet with a double portion of Elijah's spirit upon him. And when Elijah found Elisha, he was farming. He was behind a bunch of oxen and he was plowing up the ground. And Elijah came and said, hey, come with me. You're going to be my disciple. You're going to be a prophet. You're going to replace me. And Elisha went home, said goodbye to his parents, then came out and took the oxen, sacrificed them to God, took the yoke, built a fire with that wood, and burnt that sacrifice to God. It's kind of like he was saying, I'm never coming back to this life. And I'm not, I'm not going to return to this life. God has something brand new for me. And, and that, I think, was what Levi was doing. He said, there's something new that God has for me. I can't return to this life, this profession of tax collecting. And this was the best decision that this man could have made. I mean, just think about it. I'll put it like this. What would you rather be? A, a, a person that stole and thieved and collected taxes and was forgotten by history or one of the greatest and most well-read authors of all time. Because that's exactly what Matthew became. He became probably, I, I, in my opinion, the most read author in all of history. Why do I say that? Well, because so many people over the last thousand, couple thousand years have said to themselves, I'm going to sit down and read the Bible. And when they turn to the Old Testament, they say, that's really long. And so they say, I'm going to read the New Testament first. And they start with what? The book of Matthew. And he became a man that God used greatly. His life, formerly spent on Rome's kingdom and his own self-interests, became an exciting part of God's kingdom. You see, this is what Jesus does. He comes to this man who's just there going through life, hopeless, and he gives him hope. He, he takes this man who's an outcast that nobody really wants to have anything to do with, and he calls him into the family. He takes a man whose life is fairly meaningless and he gives him purpose and meaning, a commission, a job to do. He includes the unincludable. He reaches into Matthew's life. And just in thinking about this, I just want to say it like this. Don't be afraid to follow Jesus. It's the best life that you could ever live to follow Jesus. One example of this in Scripture comes from the book of Esther. You know, she, because of God's sovereign hand on her life, had ascended to become the queen of an ancient, the ancient Persian empire. And her life was a life of power and prestige. She had fans and followers. People adored who Esther was. But nobody really knew that she was actually Jewish by race. And eventually in Persia, a spirit of anti-Semitism began to spread. And they began actually legalizing the persecution of Jewish people. And Esther struggled with this. She began to wonder, should I come out with it? Should I announce that I am connected to this persecuted people? And as she considered whether she was up to the task of interceding for God's people, she finally came to a place where she concluded, if I perish, I perish. It's one of the most beautiful sentences in the Old Testament in Esther 4, verse 16. If I perish, I perish. You see, she became convinced that there was nothing better than to live for God, even if it meant dying for God. And through her actions, Jewish lives were saved. And she became something much more meaningful than the mere queen of Persia. She, she became Esther. You know, she became the heroine of God's people. This was the best life that she could ever live. And listen, like Esther and like Levi, there are sure to be things that we will have to leave uh, behind so that we can follow Jesus. It might be a career like Levi. It might be a relationship. It might be a desire. It might be an attitude. It might be a sin. But if Levi or if Matthew, if, if, if he was here today, he would say to us, it's worth it. Follow Jesus. I have no regrets whatsoever that I set aside that part of my life to follow hard after Jesus Christ. 
And part of the reason I mention this is because so often when we're confronted with things that we know that Jesus wants to, us to let go of, we say, I can't imagine life without this thing that he's asking me to abandon. But, but he's the only one that can satisfy us. It's not the thing that we're holding on to. It's him. And Matthew is a great testimony to that truth. Okay, the second thing I want you to see comes in verse 15, and it's just this. It's really the answer to our question about who gets to go into the kingdom. It's this. Jesus' kingdom is for sinners. Let's read about it in verse 15. It says, And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. It appears that what has happened here is that Matthew decides, you know, immediately to throw a big party at his home. He's a wealthy man. He's probably got a large home at this point. And he, he invites all of his friends. This is kind of like a, the, the day of salvation for him is a day of celebration. You know, he's found Jesus. Jesus has found him. He wants all his friends and family to know about Jesus. So he throws this big party. It's a big festival. And you might also want to see it like a going away party. You know, he's going to leave now for a while. He's going to traipse all throughout Israel with Jesus, become Jesus' disciples. So he's kind of saying goodbye to everybody, and he invites his friends. And notice how his friends are described. All through the passage, they're called tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> that's the crew that's there together uh, with Matthew and, and with Jesus in that home. Okay, this is really cool because... Just in case someone thought of Jesus' call of a tax collector as like a temporary oversight, you know, like this exception to the rule, Jesus goes into the house and he eats and drinks with Levi's friends, these tax collectors and sinners. And this was offensive to the religious leaders. You know, it, it was already offensive to them that he was building his team with a person like Levi but now his offense metastasizes. It's like it becomes policy. Jesus came for sinners. It wasn't just a mistake. This is what he's about. It's like he makes zero effort to avoid them, first of all, but now seems to pursue and even prefer sinners. Okay, but, but the question is, who are these sinners? You know, why does Mark call them sinners? And then Jesus, at the end of the passage, he says, I came to save sinners. He doesn't rebuke or, or, or try to rebuff this idea that that's who he's with. He says, that's exactly who I'm with. Okay, so here's one idea. It, it's possible that when he talks about tax collectors and sinners, that he's talking about the, the, like the, the Jewish mafia there in town. You know, like the ruffians, the outcasts in Capernaum. You know, this like unsavory sort of people uh, that would connect with tax collectors. And maybe that's what we're meant to see here. People that were living on the fringe of society. You know, so maybe we're supposed to envision something like when Obi-Wan Kenobi says to Luke Skywalker before they go to Mos Eisley, you know, Mos Eisley Spaceport, where you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy, you know, and maybe, maybe that's what we're to imagine, you know, going into the cantina and the music's playing and you just look around and it's all these creepy people like, you know, or something like that. Maybe that's the image that we're supposed to get. But listen right now, most scholars actually reject that idea of what the word sinners means. Because more than likely, it was merely the religious leaders who gave the designation sinners to this group. And their definition of sinners would be people who did not abide by their rigid Pharisaic standards. In other words, these were common people. For them, the rules were just too tough. They just couldn't keep all that religiosity. So they just gave up after a while. The Pharisees referred to them as sinners, people living outside the strict standards set by their traditions. And uh, so perhaps this is who the sinners are. I think it's probably a blend of both. You probably have a mix of both types. People living in open rebellion against God and his clear directives, but also people who just couldn't keep up with the religious standards of the day and just said, you know, I, I just can't do it. Just common people, non-Pharisees, gathered together in Levi's home. It means that they're living sinfully and not religiously. 
They didn't care what the religious community thought about them. Okay, now, now this picture, though, of Jesus reclining at table with this group. And, and when he says that he's reclining there or they're reclining there, the way, what, what that meant in that culture was that they had a very low table that was on the floor, and they'd put their left arm forward and lean on it. They'd jut their feet out away from the table, and then they would eat with their right hands. That's what it meant for them to recline. And so when, when you see this picture, there's Jesus and his disciples and tax collectors and sinners eating all together. It's one of the most beautiful pictures that we have of Jesus. Now, there he is. There's no pretension. There's no judgment. He's eating and drinking with the outcasts of society. And, and Mark, of course, is presenting Jesus as the Son of God. So this is meant to be a shock to the reader. Here comes the Son of God, the most holy person who's ever lived, and that's where he goes. That's where he's eating. It's meant to shock the reader. But the question is, should we be shocked? By this point in God's revelation, should we be shocked by Jesus doing this? And I think in one sense, we shouldn't be. Because when you look in the Old Testament, one thing you discover is that God dispensed grace to the sinner. God often called the sinner to be part of his plan. He chose Noah, a man who after the flood succumbed to the debauchery of drunkenness. He chose Abraham, a man who often gave in to fear and half obedience to God rather than full obedience to God. He chose Isaac, who was a passive man who resisted God's plans. He chose Jacob, a man who spent half of his life conniving and deceiving the people around him, manipulating everything to his advantage. He chose David, a man who committed adultery and murder while seated on the throne of Israel. Okay, this is the same God who chose Rahab, a prostitute in Jericho, to become an ancestor of Jesus and a hero for God's people. This is the same God who chose to bless the widow at Zarephath through the ministry of Elijah or the leprous commander of the Syrian army named Naaman. This is the same God who chose to forgive the people of Nineveh, barbaric people doing evil things after Jonah the prophet came to them and told them that in 40 days Nineveh would be overthrown. Even the most wicked king in Israel's history, a man named Ahab, he was married to Jezebel. They committed great atrocities. There came a moment in Ahab's life where he was convicted in his heart, he repented of his sin, and God said to his prophet, do you see Ahab who has humbled himself before me? And he extended grace and mercy and forgiveness to this man. This is who God is. He refers to himself as the God who forgives. He said to Moses in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, I am the Lord, a God gracious, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. What's, what's he saying there? He's saying, I'm the perfect blend of justice and grace, the perfect blend of holiness and mercy. I don't let sin escape unpunished, but I also forgive. It's like in the nature of God is the mystery of the cross of Jesus Christ. How could he be so loving and gracious and merciful, yet so holy and just and right and true, it's all found there in the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what you see in the Old Testament. But after this scene and after Jesus' life, when Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the Father, the church continued on in Jesus' tradition. You know, for the first 10 years of the church's life, the church rem remained predominantly Jewish, but it reached the regular folks in Israel. Then after a decade, the Spirit unleashed this group of predominantly Jewish Christians upon the nations. The whole world began to hear the hope of the gospel message. And that world that they went into was so different from the world that they'd grown up in, with the rules and customs that they'd lived in. The Roman world was a bastion of all kinds of sins that were unacceptable in Israel. 
But that didn't stop the church. It didn't stop the gospel from going in to the highways and hedges, like Jesus said in his parable. They compelled people to come. They preached the love of Christ so that God's house would be filled. And it worked, you guys. People all over the world began placing their faith in Jesus. This tax collectors and sinners group began to expand as people submitted themselves to Christ. Places that you'd never think Christianity would succeed, Christianity blossomed and flourished in Rome and Ephesus and Corinth. The church was established. And Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, he said this little phrase that I love so much. He, he recounted this long list of sins that are incompatible with the kingdom of God. And then he said this in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. He said, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I love that phrase. And such were some of you. You see, Paul looked at the Corinthian church and he said, I know each one of us has a past. Each one of us is guilty. Each one of us needed God's grace and forgiveness. The image there is that Jesus then took them out of that life and a new humanity was started by Jesus. But all of that, the Old Testament mercy and grace that God extended, Jesus here seated with tax collectors and sinners, the fact that the church reached into the highways and byways of the world, all of that is a mere foreshadowing of the great and final destiny of God's people. Revelation 19 verse 9 portrays an image in eternity with a table called the marriage supper of the Lamb, where God's people gather together from every generation and they eat with Jesus at his table. And they sing of Jesus and say, you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. You see, this thing that Jesus did is meant to be emblematic of what he's trying to do overall. He wants to bring as many people as possible to his table in his kingdom to dine and to eat with him. So I told you, we're asking the question, who gets to come into God's kingdom? Well, the answer we're seeing, at least in part here, is very simple. Sinners get to come into his kingdom. And for this, we rejoice, because that's who we are. All right, the third thing I want you to see, though, is not just that Jesus loves sinners, but that he he works to call sinners. And, And we'll see this from the last little segment of this episode in verse 16 and 17. Let's read it together. It says, And the scribes, of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so, so somehow the scribes of the Pharisees saw what was happening in Levi's house. I don't think they were actually there, but they they heard or they saw from the outside what was happening. And, you know, they're already bothered with Jesus. And so they begin to question Jesus' disciples. Did you notice that? They don't actually ask Jesus. They ask Jesus' disciples. Now, who are these guys that are questioning Jesus' disciples? Mark describes them as the scribes of the Pharisees. Now, we've already looked a little bit at scribes. We saw them last week. Scribes were like the legal experts. They were experts in the Old Testament law of God. But there were different religious sects that were around in that time. Some were the Sadducees, some were the Pharisees. And both of those groups had their own scribes. So these were scribes, legal experts, lawyers for the Pharisees or on the Pharisees' team. Who were the Pharisees, though? The name Pharisee, it means separate one. Somebody who's separated themselves. And that was the mission of the Pharisees. They wanted to separate themselves from a Greek and Roman influence, from sinful desires. And uh, they started out actually really well. The, their beginning happened in between the Old and the New Testaments. But by the time Jesus came around, they'd been on the scene for a few hundred years and they'd atrophied into a highly legalistic group. 
Their whole goal was to build a fence around the Torah. So you have the word of God. They didn't want to disobey God's word, so they built a fence around God's word. That means they made God's word even more difficult to keep than it already was. And so they were building a fence around the Torah to try to avoid any even possible violation of God's will. Now, they were, and this might surprise some of us because they show up so often in the Gospels, they were actually the religious minority in the time of Christ. There was another group that was in uh, greater power uh, than the Pharisees called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were much more liberal theologically. They denied the Bible, they denied miracles, they denied a future resurrection, they only believed the first five books of the Bible, not all of the Old Testament. And they were in greater power because they had really acquiesced to Ro the Roman government. Uh, but the Pharisees were also around during that time. And it is worth noting that Jesus barely dealt with the Sadducees in his ministry. I think part of it is because they were so far gone. They, they were so different from Jesus and his positions. Uh, Jesus and the Sadducees' theology were miles apart. But the Pharisees were actually closer to Jesus' positions. Uh, it was their interpretations and their traditions that distanced them from Jesus. But he wanted to reach them. He wanted to try to get a hold of their lives. And many Pharisees actually did eventually surrender to Jesus. Uh, some of them were involved in burying Jesus when he died on the cross. Uh, Paul, the apostle, in his former life, was a Pharisee. So the Lord had a plan for many of these Pharisees, is what I'm trying to say. But this group, they want to be separate. And when they see Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors, they're appalled. You know, their whole goal was separation. And now they look at Jesus and they conclude, okay, that's not what you want, apparently. You don't want to separate, you want to join. And so they ask the disciples, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? Okay, Jesus, though, he heard their question. You know, this is real common throughout the Gospels. The religious leaders go to Jesus' disciples, and then Jesus hears that they're questioning his disciples, and he's like, hey, what are you doing talking to my kids? And he interjects and answers the question for his disciples. And he says to them something that they would have heard before when he says in verse 17, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. This was a, a, a widely received proverb in that day and in that era. And it's a profound statement from Jesus. What he's saying is he's saying, you know, a doctor, a doctor treats people who are unhealthy. A doctor would never expect a patient to seek treatment for health. You know, like, hey, what, so tell me what brings you in today. Well, you know, I'm just feeling fit as a fiddle, and I just thought I'd come in and have you check it out. Like, I am just doing so good right now. No, a doctor expects that when you make an appointment with him or her that you are there because there's a perceived illness or injury or something that you need their help with. People seek treatment from a doctor for sickness and injury. It's a lack of health that drives a person to the doctor. And this is how Jesus felt. He felt like he was a doctor serving all who were sick. This statement from Jesus said a lot about how he viewed himself, but also how he viewed the Pharisees and the people he ate with that day. First of all, I want you to think about what it says about Jesus. I, I wanted to say it like this. I, I think that when he says this, it reveals that Jesus is actually the truest Pharisee who ever lived. You see, Pharisees strove to be separate from sin. But in reality, all they ever did was create new sins. Sins like hypocrisy and pride and legalism, and judgment, and pretension. Jesus, though, he saw separation in a totally different way than the Pharisees. He would come as the great physician. That means he's different from everybody that he's with. He sees them as sick, he is healthy. He couldn't distance himself, though, from the very patients who needed his care. So as he doctored sinners, he never engaged in our sin. The sickness of his patients never became his sickness. He immersed himself into a sinful humanity 
but he never rebelled with sinful humanity. The Bible says that he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. He died for our sins upon the cross, but he never participated in our sins. And because of this, Jesus showed us what real separation looks like. Rosaria Butterfield, in her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, said it well. She said, Jesus dined with sinners, but he didn't sin with sinners. Jesus lived in the world, but he didn't live like the world. This is the Jesus paradox. And the reason it's a paradox is because it's often a struggle for us. You know, often we err on one of two extremes. You know, on the one hand, when we try to be holy, we often become rigid and isolated, like the Pharisees. On the other hand, when we try to reach out to others, like Jesus, we often become influenced. We metamorphize into the very society that we'd love to reach. Too easily, we either on one extreme unlovingly separate from society, or we unwisely become just like society. You know, the Bible does say in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, that bad company ruins good morals. But bad company could not ruin Jesus, is the point. You know, he perfected loving outreach mixed with personal holiness. In other words, it's like this. The most separate and different person who ever lived was also the ultimate friend of sinners. That's Jesus. But his statement also says a lot about sinners. Look at what he said there at the end of verse 17. He said after he said that he came to come to, to heal the sick, he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Don't miss what Jesus is doing when he says these words. He said he was like a doctor going to the sick. He did not come for righteous people, but for sinners. What did Jesus mean? You know, he's saying this to the Pharisees. So did he mean, when he said this to the Pharisees, did he, did he mean when he looked at them, hey, you guys, you have no sin, and you are righteous, and you are healthy, so that's why I didn't come to reach into your life, but into the lives of these people. No, not at all. Like I said earlier, some Pharisees actually became believers and became champions of the gospel. They knew that they needed Jesus. The Pharisees themselves were sinners in need of forgiveness. But what Jesus was saying was that he could not help the Pharisees as long as they thought they were healthy. They didn't know that they were sick. They couldn't see their sin. And as long as someone thinks they have no sin, Jesus cannot help them. Just as someone who thinks they have no sickness will not pursue medical attention, so someone who thinks they're righteous will not turn to Jesus. You see, in Jesus' estimation, we are all sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. And the problem with this is that this label is most often rejected today. Someone would say, I'm not a sinner. I'm not broken. I don't need to be well. But those who've received the gospel eventually came to a place in their lives where they were able to say this, to say, I am a sinner. I am in need of his grace. I am broken, and so is everyone on earth. But unfortunately, to hear that so often for someone who, like a Pharisee, thinks they have no error in their ways, it is offensive. But I just want to remind you, Calvary Monterey, this is who we are. We are sinners seated around the table with Jesus Christ. We need him. We need his grace. We need his forgiveness. We need his cleansing. We need the great doctor to come and, and heal us. And we need him to keep on healing, healing us, amen? It's, it's, it's something we need him to continue to produce in our lives. No matter who we are, no matter what our background or our proclivities or our temptations, we need Jesus in our lives. Our minds are broken, our wills are broken, our feelings and souls and bodies all need Jesus' constant attention. Sin has plagued us and Jesus is our only answer. So this is who gets to come into the kingdom. Sinners who say, I agree with Jesus 
and I turn from that and believe in the good news that he died in my place upon that cross so that I could be forgiven and cleansed of my sin. That's who gets to go into the kingdom. Now let me close with a few applications for you today before I let you go. Number one, I would say this. Know that there's nothing that you could ever give up for Jesus that is better than Jesus. Okay, Matthew or Levi gave up his career, and as he gave that up, there was, you know, Jesus was better than that tax collecting career. And I've watched so many believers just live miserable lives because I think the most miserable life you could live is to be a believer who's just living halfway, holding on to something from the old life that Jesus wants you to let go of without fully abandoning yourself to him. It's, It's a miserable way to live. But there's nothing that you could ever give up for Jesus that's better than Jesus. Number two, if needed, and I say this with great caution, if needed, choose Jesus over your career. This might be for one person all day long today, that there's something happening in your job or your career that is asking you to compromise your Christianity and your faith to such a degree that you need to prayerfully, wisely, with discernment, exit that career. If that point comes in your life, choose Jesus over your career. Number three, keep praying for the Levi in your life. You know, the, the reality is the name Levi, I mean, it, he was the namesake of the tribe of Levi, the tribe that was supposed to be set apart for the service of God. Somebody gave this guy that name. You know, his parents, when they named him that, I'm sure they had high hopes for what he would become, and I doubt that they thought to themselves, like, I hope one day he grows up to become a crook who steals from the people of Israel. It <laughs> probably wasn't what they were rooting for. Him. And if you have a Levi in your life, just keep praying. Keep on praying. Keep asking the Lord to work in their life. Number four, repent when, not if, but when the pharisaical spirit arises within you. What's the pharisaical spirit? The pharisaical spirit sees someone else's sin and says, I can't believe that anybody would do that. Okay? And this pharisaical spirit will arise in us at some point in our lives. I'm sure many of you have done this. Here's an example of, I think, how most of us do it at some point. We all were teenagers at some point in life, and then uh, we grew, grew older, and we look back on those teenage years, and we think, why did I care about what other people thought? Why did I, you know, spend so much time worrying about all of that? And then we look at teenagers, and we say, why do you care so much about what other people, you shouldn't think that way, forgetting all the while that that's exactly what we were like back then. Okay, so when that spirit arises in you, repent of it. Number five, ask God to help you become more like how Jesus is in this story. You know, Jesus is there able to navigate holiness, righteousness, purity, but lovingly outreaching to people who were in need. Um, And, you know, I mention this partly because Usually this passage, you you know, you read it and then churches just jump right into how can we do this thing that Jesus did? And, And the reality is this has been hard for Christians from the very beginning of what the church is. And a lot of people just don't do it all that well. Like I said, we trend a lot of times towards legalism or we trend towards just morphing into the world around us. What we really need is to be transformed into Christ-likeness, to become like Jesus, for his nature to be so infused into who we are that we're changed and able to do some of the things that he was able to do in this story. And then number six, keep returning to the great physician. You know, he, he looks at, for people who are unhealthy, who need that help, keep turning to him and saying, Lord, there's stuff going on in my mind, my thought life, my soul. I need you to help me. Keep going to your great physician, and he will help you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the grace and mercy that you've extended, Lord, to us. We praise you, Lord, for being good to us, for reaching into our lives. And Lord, this morning, we we are just so thankful that you, Lord, would love sinners so much that you would come to live with us, dwell with us, and make a way for us to be forgiven. And Lord, we pray that you'd forgive us for any thought that says, 
The people that get to go into the kingdom are the good people. The people that get to go into the kingdom are the ones who have lived a good life. Lord, forgive us of that wicked thought that is so contrary to the message of Christ and his gospel. Thank you, Lord, that the people that get to go into the kingdom are sinners who have received your forgiveness and grace by your blood. We praise you, Lord. And we pray, Father, that more and more people in our community would get to know you in this way, as the forgiver of sin. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, church, and sing this last song with Riley. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Sing who shakes, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I'll sing you've done for me let's sing this together sing worthy worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave Great rest of your Sunday and a good first week at Life Groups. We'll see you soon.